Yes, sir. Uh, could you touch on the inheritance that a Christian can lose in the kingdom of God? All right. Take your Bible and get Colossians chapter 3 and uh, Galatians chapter 5. Colossians 3 and Galatians 5. And then with your third hand, probably most of these you have to have three hands to get them, is 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Now this has to do with inheritance. And again, this is a doctrine. It isn't, it isn't taught in the schools. The stuff in the Word of God doesn't show up anywhere. You get these things where the teaching is, well, the important thing is just the fundamentals. They don't even agree on the fundamentals. There are two kinds of fundamentalists. Now, I know what kind you're used to, because I know you're a pastor, and I know the kind of teaching you've had. You've had a, you've had a teaching where the autonomy of the local church, separation of the church and the state, the immersion of the believer in eternal security, and the premillennial and the coming of Christ are considered to be fundamental. And I'm that way myself. I believe those are just as fundamental as anything else. But your Presbyterian interdenominational type of fundamentalist only has five fundamentals. And those five fundamentals are in the Roman Catholic Apostles' Creed, which makes every Catholic in the world a fundamentalist, and also every charismatic. Some of the fundamentalists object to the charismatic being called fundamentalists if they believe in the virgin birth, the deity of Christ, the crucifixion, the bodily resurrection, and the second coming in some form. They are a fundamentalist according to the fundamental state of a Bob Jones University in the Creed. I've got the pants at home, Bob Jones used our sermon, the fundamentals. Those fundamentals, I believe, are all charismatic and Catholic. Now, you folks, whether you know it or not, you are a Texas brand of fundamentalism. And the Texas brand comes from Springfield or Arlington, and both them come from J. Frank Norris. And J. Frank Norris was not an interdominational, ecumenical type of fundamentalist. He was a Baptist fundamentalist. All right, now uh, Colossians chapter 3 and Galatians chapter 5 and 1 Corinthians chapter 6. This goes beyond the fundamentals. Colossians 3, 23. Watch it carefully. Whatsoever you do, works. Do it heartily, works. As of the Lord, not unto men. Knowing that of the Lord you shall receive the reward, works, of inheritance. For you serve, works the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord Christ. But he that doeth wrong, works, shall receive for the wrong which he hath done, works, and there is no respect to persons. Now you see that? That passes of those of the inheritance, verse 24, is an earned reward. Now how could anybody get that confused with eternal life? Don't you believe by grace you're saved through faith? Don't you believe the gift of God is eternal life? then why would you think the inheritance of the kingdom of God having to do with with, with, uh, with grace? Inheriting the kingdom of God has to do with an earned reward. All right, Galatians chapter 5, verse 19. Now, in this first list in Galatians 5, you're given a list of works. This is not a list of people. This is a list of works. When we get to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, we'll be looking at a list of people, not of works. That's very important because the works you're about to read in Galatians chapter 5 are the works of the flesh, not the works of an unsaved man. They're the works of the flesh. And the context is in the flesh of a Christian. All right, Galatians chapter 5, verse 17. Well, I'll begin at verse 16 so you get the context. Galatians 5, 16. This I say then, walk in the Spirit. I aim at a saved man, unsaved man. I may say, save man. Why, sure. Walk in the Spirit. You shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. Is that the save man or lost man? Save man. And these are contrary to one another, so you cannot do the things you would. But if you're led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are manifest to these. Now notice this, the works of the flesh. In who? In the Christian. In the Christian. Look at verse 20, look at verse 22, the fruit of the Spirit. Talking about the two natures of the Christian. All right, one nature of spiritual brings forth fruit, the other nature is flesh and brings forth works. Then the child of God, then what follows? What follows is a list of everything you heard of, ever heard of unsaved people doing. We have a fellow down there in Pensacola, he's a 
five-point tulip hard-shell Calvinist named L.R. Shelton, Jr. He's uh, L.R. Shelton, Jr.'s son, L.R. Shelton out of New Orleans, the old five-point tulip Calvinist. And that crazy cockeyed nut is getting on the radio every Saturday and Sunday and telling people that if they are guilty of any of the sin listed in 2 Timothy 3 or Galatians chapter 5, they're unsaved. And he gets on there and says, you have to look out for this gospel of carnal Christianity. And this gospel of carnal Christianity is not the true gospel. Because the true gospel sets a man free from the law and free from the law of sin and death. So the man who's saved by the real gospel of grace does never commit any of these things. You know what he's trying to do? He's trying to talk his congregation out of the salvation. He's trying to convince his congregation if they're not all living sinless lives, they've never really been saved. And that means he himself is just as carnal as a devil. Any man that professes to be saved on the basis of how good he lives is flesh. Galatians chapter 5, verse 19. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these? Adultery. That's clear. Married couples messing around. Fornication. That's clear. Anybody messing around. Uncleanness. Cover number, number of things. Lasciviousness. That's like pornography. Idolatry, putting anything ahead of God. Witchcraft. Can a Christian get involved with witchcraft? Sure, Johnny Todd. You say, if he's saved, yeah, he's saved. You say, what you're doing? He's still fooling with it. Rasmussen kicked him out of the church because he was fooling with it. Now, you take Jack Chick. Jack Chick's a fine fella. I know him real well. Fine fella. Now, only two things about Jack Chick that are wrong as far as I know. First of all, he's kind of gullible. Jack Chick tends to believe anything anybody tells him. And the second thing about him is he's a reporter. When Jack Chick puts out the Godfather in Alberto, he isn't telling you necessarily what he believes. He's telling you what the other guy told him. I get letters all the time. People say, what, how do you support Jack Chick after he said this and after he said this? And they this fellow, Alberto Rovier is a fake, and blah, 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 blah. I write back to those Christians and say, do you take a newspaper? They do. You pay and subscribe, you give money for somebody to take a newspaper, bring it to your house, and that thing is 85% lies from cover to cover. You never holler about it all, you pay for it. So if you buy some of Jack Chick's stuff, and sometime he might have something that isn't quite right, I don't get upset about it. I mean, I think sometimes there's some of the stuff in there is not right, but it isn't Jack Chick's. He's reporting what the guy gave him. Johnny Todd gave him a big old lie, and he had this thing, you know, in witchcraft, you know, and Johnny Todd was one of the 13 witches that ran the world. <laughs> Cut it out, man. <laughs> Cut it out. I suppose he told Hitler what to do. He told, you know, I told he told Vito Genovese, you know, who to hit, you know, that kind of stuff. All, all that stuff, man. One of the 13 witches. What a, what a thing, man. So first time I Johnny Todd, I made a tape on him, you know. And I just made a fool out of him and called him everything but white and turned it loose. Not a fool got real upset with me. And then about a year later, Rasmussen churched him, kicked him out of his church down there for not paying money owed. And they caught him teaching witchcraft to the young people in the young people's department. I got the stuff at home with Rasmussen's signature on it. Rasmussen ain't no liar. He sent out over 20,000 copies of his argument with Custer all over the country. He got the stuff on him. And bad got out of church because he made a tape. He forgot to de the back. He says, Johnny, young people, the young people's department. You're just living after the flesh. Witchcraft, hatred. Now, you wouldn't be guilty of that, would you? <laughs> you never heard of a Christian hating anybody, have huh? Aren't people funny, you know? Here's old Bob Jones. Look out for new evangelical. Look out for, hey, bud, how about hating your brother's guts? How about that? Will that do okay? Oh, Ruffman hates everybody. No, it's just the way I talk. <laughs> I don't hate nobody. Honest to God, I don't hate nobody. Not even the poor. I'd like to see somebody get rid of them, but I wouldn't get rid of them. <laughs> and it wouldn't no, no good, no good to get rid of me, just get another one. I'm no use to martyr a guy to just make a martyr out of him, you know. I don't hold against anything personally against anybody lying in the face of this earth. God is my witness. Now, if they're going to attack the Bible, I'm going to kick the britches. But uh, I've got nothing against them personally. It to me. I've got uh, what they say about me is immaterial. 
A guy pulled me up. A lot of guys be about sending me a very strong letter, cussing me out. And he said, I know you're strong, Brother Ruckman. I thought to myself, why, well, you silly fool, you silly fool, hang up, man. What are you, what are you trying to give me anyway? I know you're strong. That's the way a woman talks. I know you're strong because you can take a bad letter. Oh, cut it out, will you? Cut it out. I'll tell you what tells when you're strong, man, when they got you tied down the front room and got your boy girl back there in the kitchen, putting her hand on a burner on the stool and trying to get you to reject Christ, and your kids, kids screaming and saying, Daddy, make him stop it. Daddy, make him stop it. Then we'll see how strong you are. I know what strength is. I don't profess to be strong. You're strong because you can take a bad letter. What a fool. What a blank fool. Amen, 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 amen. Hatred, variance, emulation, that's like jealousy, wrath, strife. You've never seen a bunch of Christians strive, have you? <laughs> I've seen them in business meetings stand up, a lady take a Bible and hit a guy right in the face with it. In a church business meeting, even with a Bible, blah, you know. Holy Bible, authorized version, blah. <laughs> Heresies, that's Ruckman. Envings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of which I tell you before, as I have told you in time past, now watch it, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Now that's aimed at a Christian. And if you do those things, you'll lose an inheritance. Why? Because an inheritance is an earned reward. Colossians chapter 3. Now I'll come to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, and I'll show you how you know this thing is so. 1 Corinthians 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Verse uh, 9. Here's how you know this thing is true. Did you ever, I've done this many times, I've been at many a Christian camp when it got come, the competition got kind of hot. You know, flesh is flesh. And you get a bunch of young guys together, you know, about 20, 25, playing softball and blood ball and basketball, and tempers get hot. And umpire makes a call, and somebody argues the umpire, you know. I've been in those Christian camps for I don't even know how long. I tell him, Brother Denant, the other day at the table, I said, I know I'm getting old because I'm playing blood ball with the grandchildren <laughs> of the guys I played blood ball with in Chautauqua. That's rough, man. That's rough. Man, you're playing blood ball with these guys at Chautauqua in 1957 and 1958. And now you're playing with the grandchildren. And the grandchildren are 17, 18 years old. And I know I'm slipping. I'm going to have to quit after a while. I mean, I, the last couple of years, it's been getting near quitting time. I can tell. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still playing hockey, but, but, but that, that blood ball, that thing is just all, you know, gripping and arm locks and wrist holes and head locks and hair locks and hammer locks and full Nelsons. My muscle ain't holding together like they used to. <laughs> Last time I got in there, I played with one guy. I taught him how to play, and he's about 35 now. I played when he was 15. I taught him how to play. I used to beat that guy to death, you know, he's about 17. And I got in the pool with him last summer. He knocked me around like a ball bearing in a garbage can. Now, I don't, know I, I don't know where I was at. And about two summers ago, playing butt ball, one of them got my left eye and got a, got a, got a, nail on it, cut the eyeball, and then last summer when I was playing with him, I had to tangle some guy who's about 30 years old, and about uh, 6 feet, and about 240, and uh, climbed like, out of a 17-inch leg, like climbing a mountain trying to get to him, and he got a hold of that thumb, and like to pull that thing out, man, I got out of the pool, and I told the guy, pull that thing, and he yanked it, and I said, pull it again, and he hit it again, about the screen, and somebody said, it wasn't broken, it is now. <laughs> And that thing swelled up about the size of a softball and turned black. And I couldn't hold a chalk that night, man. I was holding the chalk between this thing and another thing. I couldn't get my finger on the chalk. And that thing quit hurting after about two weeks. And after about two months, I got where I could, you know, grip something again. And but I couldn't play blood ball for another two months. And I played blood ball last Saturday with him again. <laughs> <laughs> but that grip wasn't what it should have been. I mean, I was losing a lot of holes. <laughs> so I'm going to have to quit somewhere down the line. But that stuff is flesh, you see. And I'm fleshy like anybody else. I just never could resist it. 
I came up here. My wife said to me about eight years ago, she said, what are you going to be when you grow up? <laughs> and I said, I'm going to be a hockey goalie. <laughs> and the next year, I got to play goalie. The next year, I got my, I was, I, I must, I must give Michigan credit. I got ice skates the first time in Lansing, Michigan. And I was 61 years old. And I got on the skate, could actually stand up, <laughs> and got to play them. And I played my first game in about two hours. We had played an outdoor rink, 20 degrees. I never knew, I never knew that game was, I knew, I knew it was a good game. But I know it was that good. Now you talk about sweating, boy, at 20 degrees, you just sweat like a horse. I'm at 20 degrees, man. You can take your stock and cap off and just wring it out. And I went back after that game, got back home. I remember the night after I got back home, I was sitting in the living room, the cold night down there, and we were burning a fire in the fireplace. And I like getting back home, and I'm going to enjoy being my wife and my girls. But you know, you know, women, you know. And I was, and I was sitting there in that chair, you know, and I kind of crossed that living room, and my wife was there, and the two girls, Laura and Rachel, they're about, they're about 11. Thirteen, and I, I was enjoying being home. I looked out across that living room. That living room just turned blue. <laughs> it just went into a big blue strip of ice out there, you know. And I hear those little bodies going, blam, 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 against the wall, you know. It is those thick, clack, 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 you know. I went to the telephone. I phoned Green up on the phone, long distance. Lansing, I said, if you guys playing hockey tonight, I'm going to kill you. <laughs> and he said, we just finished the game. <laughs> well, I still go to those camps. I still play them. I've seen this many a time. I've seen many a time a guy slide in the third or a tie up at home and the umpire say out. And some Christian boy saying, look out now, look out now. All liars have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death, you know. Well, that, that verse is in there. Did you read that verse? It says, all liars shall have their part. Are you a liar? You see the dispensational problem you get into that a Christian faculty at a Christian school can't handle? They don't know what they're talking about. The verse says, all liars shall go to hell. Haven't you told some lies? Well, why do you figure you're saved? It said, all liars. That's what it said. Isn't that what it said? That's what it said, did it? You don't believe it? Go look it up. Revelation chapter 22. All liars shall have their part. It's there. Now, what are you going to do with that? You're not going to do anything with it unless you get your Bible right. All right, 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Let's get it right. 6 9. This one of Ruckman is peculiar teaching, you know. 6 9. Know ye not, the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived. Now, look at that. The unrighteous shall not inherit. You just read in Galatians, the works of the flesh, and those that do such things shall not inherit. Now you're reading, it's people. Know ye not the unrighteous, that's a man, shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Be not deceived. You the fornicators, here he goes again. Nor idolaters, here he goes again. Nor adulterers, here he goes again. With the same things. But this time he's calling them people. He's not calling them the works of the flesh nor effeminate, as you queer, abuse themselves with mankind, sodomite, lesbians, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners, shall get to heaven? Nope. Shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Now watch it carefully. Eleven. And such were you were those things. Amen? Weren't some of you idolaters, adulterers, fornicators, drunkards? Wasn't that some of you were? Or I trust were some of you. But you're washed. You're sanctified. You're justified in the name of the Lord Jesus by the Spirit of our God. You're no longer an adulterer. You're no longer a fornicator. You're no longer an idolater. You're a Christian. You're a Christian. You see, what if you do those things? Then you're committing the works of the flesh in a Christian. That solves your problem. Now, listen, I, I don't care what they say. If the book says it, that's it. There's no such thing as a Christian who is a liar. Now, you can call a guy a liar. I call them liars. But theologically, that isn't right. <laughs> if they're saved, they are a lying Christian. <laughs> See? A Christian is never a drunkard. 
but a Christian can get drunk. A Christian is never a thief, but a Christian can steal. Now, that's what's going on in those pastors. Now, you know why that ends? It has to do with spiritual circumcision, which is something else the faculty knows nothing about. So they can't get the Bible right any time they pick it up. Now, here's what you got. Here's a man right here. There's his flesh. That's old Peter Ruffman right there. That's flesh. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. Right well, there he is. Or right inside him is another man. That man, the soul. And that soul shaped just like that flesh. They don't know about it. This don't look to him for it. And that soul goes down. That soul has arms. It has nose, body, lips, teeth, teeth. There should be weeping, wailing, gnash of teeth. Teeth, jaw, tongue, eyes, ears, nose, throat, mouth, ankles, ribs. And if that soul went to hell, it could burn. If that soul went to hell, it'd say, it'd lift up its eyes, being in torment, and say, send Lazarus, and dip the tip of his finger, and cool my what? You see that? I know what I'm talking about. And inside that body, there's a body shaped just like this one. It's a soul. And when I got saved, the Holy Spirit came in there, and circumcised that soul, laser operation, and cut that soul loose from that body at every point under that flesh, so at not one place in my flesh does my soul touch my body. I'm circumcised. You say, what does that mean? Free. Free. Loose from my sins. Now, in the Old Testament, if I reached out and touched a dead body like that, I defile my soul. Because my soul is stuck to my flesh, my flesh gets dirty. The reason why Christ died on the cross and buried and rose from the dead was to set up a dispensation where God could get inside a man and not be defiled. Holy Spirit come to fell in the Old Testament, told to get defiled, Holy Spirit leaves him. Like Samson, like Saul. David's worried about that. David commits adultery and says, Take not thy Holy Spirit from me. He knows he got a problem. And God cut that soul loose in there so he could indwell that body without leaving that body. So when I get saved, the Holy Spirit comes in, cuts me loose, and my flesh commits a sin. And make no mistake about it, I'm no, you know, ultra grace. You still pay for it. Be not deceived, God is not mocked, whatever a man, so you still pay for it. You still suffer for it. He that sows the flesh of the flesh, see? There's no way to get around it. Just because it isn't really you doing it, that don't mean you don't pay the piper. You pay the piper. I mean, you, you had charge of it. But that soul is not affected because that soul is not stuck to that body. The real me in there is sinless. Paul says, I delight after the law of God, after the inward man, and what I would, I do not. What I would not, that I do. So if I do, that which I would not listen. It is no more I that doeth it, but sin that dwelleth in me. O wretched man that I am, who shall live me from the body of this death? My problem is how to get out of this body, because this body gives me trouble. When I get out, I'll have it made. All right, so when I do something, I'm responsible for it. It's nature. If I tell a lie, I'm a liar. I'm not a liar. If I were to get drunk, I'm a Christian who got drunk. I would not get drunk. I'm a child of God. I remember one time, boy, if you're self-righteous, that stuff rubs you the wrong way, don't it? That really rubs you the wrong way. If you're trying to get to heaven by works, that just eats you up. <laughs> um, you say, Ruckman, what you're trying to tell me is that you can lie and get away with it, and I can't. <laughs> now, I'm not telling you that. I'm saying a lie doesn't affect my salvation. And you're going to hell anyway. But you lie, amen, brother, whether you lie or not. I'm not like Martin Luther. Martin Luther, he, he, he put it on too hard. I mean, they'd aggravate it. <laughs> and I understand that. I'm somewhat given overstatement at times. I admit that. I, some of my writings, they, you know, they, you know, a little bit, you know, it's, uh, it's like uh, Dr. DeHaan over there in, in, in Holland, Michigan, around there. Those reformers gave him such a time. Oh, DeHaan, he, he used to teach the Ten Commandments not to affect anybody. M.R. DeHaan. Said, the law is all done away with. No Ten Commandments for nobody. <laughs> I didn't write. The law is spiritual and good, Paul says. But you see, over there in Holland, Michigan, so many reformers kept getting up on Sunday 
and repeating the Ten Commandments, and the Ten Commandments just aggravated the tar out of him, so finally he made a statement just a little bit too far. And the captains would tell old Martin, you see how man is justified by works, not by faith only. You see how man is justified, James too. James too. They put James too in Martin, or finally Martin said, some of them will light my stove with James. Well, he wouldn't light his stove with James, but, but they just push him till he say it. And they push me. They push me. Well, finally, I say some things that, you know, just a little bit heavy. You know, I say, take, you know, take these commentaries and throw them in the waste basket. I don't throw them in the waste basket. I use them. I've got them in my library down there, you know. I said these translations, you know, light the fire of them and let the cat sit on them, you know, that kind of thing. Well, I use 26 translations down there. I use my right commentaries. It's kind of over, you know. And so they can push in Martin. He'd get pushed. Martin used to say this. And Martin trying to prove, Martin trying to prove once you're saved, man, you're saved. Which I believe. But, but Martin used to say every Christian ought to be a good, healthy sinner. <laughs> he said every Christian you go out and get drunk once in a while, a trifle with a pretty maiden, just so the devil doesn't get an advantage of him. <laughs> <laughs> Now, I'm too Methodist to teach that, see. <laughs> but you, I know what Martin was trying to say. Martin was trying to say, don't the devil talk you out of your salvation no matter what. I know what he's trying to say. He just didn't say it right. <laughs> so the way that thing works is, a Christian, these things here, essentially, the child of God is a Christian, essentially. But if he does the works, he loses the kingdom, and an unsaved man loses the kingdom, because an unsaved man doesn't come up till the kingdom's over. You know why the unrighteous don't inherit the kingdom? Because they're not there when it shows up. Give us something about something Christ said one time or two times. He said one time, except the man be born again, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. And the next time he said, except the man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. You wonder about that shot? That is some shot. One time he said, if you're not born again, you can't see it. The next time he said, if you're not born again, you can't enter it. He's talking about two different things. You couldn't see one kingdom of God because Paul said the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. You enter that one, but you can't see it. Now, what do you mean over here? He said, except a man be born again, he can't see the kingdom of God. He's talking about there when the kingdom of God shows up on this earth and you inherit it. He's talking about a millennium. Those are two different things. But a man has to be born again to get either one of them. You've got to be born again to get into the one that's invisible, the Holy Ghost. You've got to be born again to see the one that comes on the earth when it comes. And the unrighteous man, the unsaved, won't inherit the kingdom because he won't even be there to see it. He doesn't come up for the second resurrection. All right, let's get all this stuff together. What do we mean by this? Now that I've taught you that, I know I've taught you the truth, but when it comes to application, I'm not too sure about the application. Because the Bible says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, the Lord himself shall send from heaven, the uh, shout, voice like in trump of God, dead in Christ, so forth and so on, and caught up together with the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, so shall we ever be with the Lord. Oh, here comes the Lord. Of course, he comes now, and preferably now, better now than later. And he catches us up. We get up there and face the judgment seat of Christ. And then we have the marriage of the Lamb. Then we come back down to the earth to set up the kingdom. Well, here's the Christian who lived this life according to the flesh. And the Bible says he won't inherit the kingdom. Well, then only one of two things must be. Either he must be left up there in glory, and the Lord comes back and sets down the kingdom up here without him, and the fellow's left up there. And that doesn't make much sense, because the Bible says, so shall we ever be with the Lord. So he must come down with him. But if he comes down with him, then when he comes out here, there's nothing for him to inherit. So he's just kind of a traveling tourist <laughs> for a thousand years, kind of roaming around the countryside. He has no rain. Now, that's the most logical. I'll show you why. I turn to Luke 19. That's the most logical. And by the way, there's an example of that in the Bible, in the Old Testament. And that example is Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. And afterward, listen, afterward, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected and found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. 
Now, you know what that stuff is telling you, Christian? It's telling you if you just mess around here after you're saved, just, you know, take care of yourself and pay for your bills and feed your family and feed your gut and take care of your children, take care of your law and your car, live after the flesh. That when Christ comes back, you'll be wanting to share the millennial reign with Christ. You'll get nothing, and you'll be bawling about it. Those tears aren't wiped away from all eyes in the Revelation chapter 20, and that's after the white throne judgment. It means you're going to say, well, God, I, if I, well, give me a chance, Lord, to say you had your chance. You know what Paul said in Romans, or Second Timothy? If we suffer with him, we shall reign with him. See? Now, a Christian people, the time to suffer is now. And after you've got a sinless body like Jesus Christ, you won't be able to hurt anymore. So the order is, first you get the cross, then you get the crown. No cross, no crown. You have over in Rome, I thought I'd rather half a grapefruit in his head, walking around there with a crown on his head, sitting on the throne. He has a phone. They call him one of the princes of the church. And the guy has a crown. How many of you believe that? Let me see your hand. He has a crown. You ever watch television? <laughs> He's on a throne. It's called a pa Don't you get mad with me, you bigot. That's what they call it. They call it the papal throne. I didn't call it that. I meant to be an outhouse seat as far as I'm concerned. I'm not concerned about it. They call it a papal throne. Now, you know what that fellow thinks? He thinks he's reigning. He thinks he's reigning. He sure is in for a shock. No cross, no crown. Who are, whoever heard of Paul getting out of a, getting off a camel and having somebody spread out a purple carpet for Paul to walk down on? And then Paul stepped in the hole out of his ring and somebody bowed down and kissed it. And then Paul charged all the Roman citizens the tax money to set up his religious service so he could get up and focus, focus, abdominus, fee, fire, full form, e pluribus unum. Can you imagine that in the Bible? Trouble you Yankees, you're brainwashed. You get this stuff night and day and day and night and day and night, you have to think something to it, you know. Old pious faker walking around, God bless you, God bless you, God bless you. Put that hex on you, boy, your number's up. Did you ever read? I think I'll just read it for you. <laughs> you got enough to go to read up here anyway. Just time and life and look and gannet and string of newspapers and CBS and all that slop. ABC. Let me read you a hot one, boy. Let me read you a hot one. If I can find this thing. This is a, this is a gem. There's Rock Hudson. <laughs> B.T. finished him off. <laughs> Let's see. Uh, Billy Kelly, <laughs> Media Violent, Gilligan, <laughs> Jim Boss, Judy Garland, Joe All Roberts, Joe Lewis, Errol Flynn, W.C. Fields, S. Brother Peters II, Integration, George Myers. That's a good one. That's, that's Capone's chauffeur. George Mestic, Nick the Greek. That's another good one. Nicky Cruz. Kitty Genovese. America, heroin, the Pope's blessing, page 79. There's our boy. Nothing like historical fact to clean up a, a, a religious bigot. 1897, he blessed the Grand Charity Bazaar in Paris. In five minutes, it caught fire and 150 people burned to death. The Lord bless you. 1923, Princess Edna of Batenburg blessed. Two weeks later, in a battle, 80 wounded, 13 killed by an attempted assassin, and she was spattered with blood from head to foot. 1981, John Paul II blessed Manila, was followed by a communist revolt and four typhoons. The Lord bless you, brother. 1978, blessed Sadat at an audience. He was assassinated in three years. 1980, John Paul welcomed the Japan Prime Minister Masayisha O'Hara, and he died of a heart attack four months later. 1967, Robert Kennedy. The Lord bless you, Bobby. Dead in the 
stone gold dead in the market. 63, an audience with JFK in July. Lord bless you, Kennedy. November, dead in a micro. You better look out for that stuff. That stuff put the curse of hell on you, boy. Or put that thing on you, you say, back off, bud. Don't put that hex on me. Martin Luther King Jr., audience. Lord bless you. Bullet through the head. 67. Paul the Sixth, fat team in Portugal, welcomed Premier de Salazar, blessed him. A year later, he had a stroke and was paralyzed. 1914, Dyer Edwards, English landowner, turned papist, blessed him. Two days later, went to Rome. Four days after he got the blessing, he was dead. Kaiser Wilhelm, 1908, Lord bless you, Kaiser, <laughs> dethroned, <laughs> run out of the country. Emperor Maximilian of Mexico, 1866, blessed him, dethroned, killed by his own people. So the Pope blessed his widow. She died a maniac in exile. That's your papal blessing. Out there outside St. Peter, there's 20,000 people out there waiting for him to come out and pull on them. So they all run out of food, run out of clothing, and have to come to America to get it. Start hollering, bread, not guns. Some of you Yankees, you're the biggest chumps ever lived. You know that? Saw that stuff. All that stuff, bread, not guns. You know why they need bread in Ethiopia now instead of guns? Because they ran a Christian emperor out of that country, and his name was Eli Selassie. They put up a communist regime. When they did, God cut off their rain and cut off their water and let them starve to death. You're going to get up and play the rock music, isn't bread, not guns? You're a fool paying that bill. About to do it in South America, too, or South Africa. Luke 19, Luke 19. Luke 19, here's the Lord coming back. Luke 19. If I ever got the role in that fellow put that hex on me, I'd say, back off, Lord, knock it off, boy, knock it off. I don't want that stuff on me. I'm an American. You understand? I'm an American. You know, American, you know. American, you know. Well, I mean, you know, not pluralistic society. American, you know. Why? White, Anglo-Saxon, Protestant. <laughs> Some of you folks look like you lost your last friend. <laughs> What's wrong with being white Anglo-Saxon Protestant? You got something against them? They're a minority. Amen? You don't believe in knocking minorities, do you? <laughs> ah, yes, Luke 19. Luke 19, verse 11. He added these things. He added and spoke a parable. Verse 11, 1911. Because he was nigh to Jerusalem, and because, watch it, they thought the kingdom of God should immediately appear. Some of you can see. And he said, a certain nobleman went to a far country, heaven, to receive for himself a kingdom, and to return, second coming. And he called his ten servants, delivered them ten pounds, and said, occupy till I come. What happened to the fellow that messed up? Verse 24. And he said to them that stood by, Take from him the pound, and give it to him that hath ten pounds. 26. For I say unto you, That unto every one which hath shall be given, From him that hath not, Even that he hath shall be taken away from him. But my enemies, that they are unsaved, Which not I should reign over them, Bring hither and slay them before me. When Christ comes back, he does two things. He takes an unprofitable servant, And takes from him his rewards, And he doesn't get to reign over cities. Look at verse 17. Well, thy good servant, because thou hast been faithful in the very little, have thou authority over ten cities. Millennial reign. It looks like the Christian who lives after the flesh loses a millennial inheritance and doesn't get to reign with Christ on earth. Now, I don't know who will get to, uh, to run Detroit. But I hope maybe it be somebody like Larry Bartlett or Brother Vic or somebody. I don't know who get to run Flint. But uh, I could nominate a candidate to help run it. And uh, maybe it won't be Brother Denant. Maybe some old sick saint that prayed for Brother Denant for about 20 years. You know, you never can tell who, how it's going to be. I'd hate to measure my righteousness along the rights of some saints I've known. Uh, the Pope think he's a saint. Listen, the Pope is a backslider alongside of some of the saints I've known. I've known some saints that put him out of the ring, boy. I've known some old women down the south, boy, that have put up with nothing but trouble and sorrow and tribulation and privation for 35 or 40 years and never got any recognition, no write-ups, no rewards, and nothing for it. 
and stayed true to God and prayed and upheld the Lord's ministry and gave the widow's might, boy. And when the Lord comes back, he'll give them rain over cities. So to answer your question, brother, <laughs> as far as I can tell, when we come back, some Christians will have no authority to reign with Christ. They'll be here, but they'll just be here as travelers or sightseers. Of course, it'll be great, but it'll be better to be able to do something for the Lord after he's done so much for you. Amen? Amen. All right, something else. Nothing like a Bible to clear up the college education.